this one investor told me uh, the other day, in 2021 and 2022, everyone went to the bar together and got drunk. And 2023, we're all going to have a crazy hangover. I remember locking the door on Friday night, not opening till Monday morning. Once I went for a meeting and the guy's like, send your boss. So I was like, no, I, I'm the boss. He's like, no, no, who is working on the I said, sir, I'm the CEO of the company. Ka. He said, don't say anything, send them. So Arjun, let's begin with you and let's ask you first, how you've got here, what's your story from being their age to this age? What's your journey? Let's let's hear it all. Sure, yeah. So maybe I'll I'll start even well before your age as well, right? So as uh, Karan said, Vedya, my last name means Ayurvedic doctor. Um, I come from a legacy of 150 years of Ayurveda in my family. My grandfather, great-grandfather and generations before all Ayurvedic doctors. Um, the legacy of the business I started wasn't a business. My great-grandfather moved from Gujarat to Bombay. He set up a small Ayurvedic clinic um, in a place called Masjid Bandar. Um, and my grandfather, as was customary at the time, um, graduated from medical school and he joined his dad in the medical practice. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, my dad became one of India's most successful Ayurvedic doctors. Uh, but the story of, of why I got into Ayurveda actually is a very personal one. I was born with juvenile bronchitis. I suffered from asthma. I grew up with pumps, nebulizers, inhalers, steroids. Um, I was the only kid who couldn't have Coke, Limca, Fanta or Sprite at birthday parties. Um, I didn't have ice cream till I was 13 years old because it would jack my throat. Um, and I love cricket. This is the phone cover that I use. Uh, and I was stopped from playing cricket at age 7 by my dada uh, because there's too much dust on the cricket field. Um, and so while my friends were playing cricket and football, I was the only guy playing golf and squash and I have a hand-eye coordination problem, so it's really difficult for a seven-year-old kid to try to hit a golf ball when you can't really coordinate very well, right? And so, um, it was always in the back of my mind that, like, this is not fair. Asthma is preventing me from having a normal life. My dad saw it. I got on Ayurvedic treatment very early on in life. Um, and by age 15 and a half, I was cured of asthma completely. And what's the first thing I went and did? Um, I started playing cricket again. I went to an IB school where there wasn't a cricket team. So we convinced a history teacher to become our cricket coach. And uh, we started a small cricket team. There were only like 12, 13 people who were even interested to play. Three, four guys came to practice pretty much. And I was the guy who went to every single practice. Um, that's one thing I learned, right? I'm, I'm not very talented in anything, but I know I can work harder than anyone else. Uh, and so... I was the guy who showed up to every single practice. And so the coach made me captain of the school cricket team. Now, it was a team that played a sum total of five matches. We won three, lost two games. And it wasn't really a great team either, to be honest. But for me, that moment was very important. Becoming captain of my school cricket team. And Ayurveda had allowed me to do this. Thing. So I started believing in the science more than just family legacy. I started spending time with my grandfather. Our family formulations were in these scriptures in Gujarati and Sanskrit. Um, I wrote them on Excel on the weekends mm -hmm. with my grandfather and um, started becoming interested in the science more than just family medicine, right? So that's the background into my twist with Ayurveda growing up. I went to college in the US of when I was 17 and a half for my undergrad to a place called Brown University. Um, and there I went to study biotechnology um, so I could take forward my grandfather's legacy of Ayurveda. I went to a liberal arts college. Um, in America, you got to spend five hours in the lab if you want to do bio or chem. Um, I didn't want to spend five hours in the lab. So I switched very quickly to economics and politics. My dada promised me he'll pay for my education. After the first year when he saw what I was studying, he stopped paying and he made my dad pay. <laughs> uh, but I learned lots outside the classroom that really shaped the way I think, right? So in my first few months of college, this girl who was down the hall from me, she was Dutch and she was teaching us yoga. And for me, it was pretty crazy, right? That it's Indian, I'm Indian. And I'm learning yoga from a Dutch girl. And then I, I sort of went around America and I saw yoga mats, yoga gyms, yoga apparel, Lululemon, multi-billion dollar industry in the US. And I started thinking to myself, like, it's amazing that yoga is global, but it sucks that we have nothing to do with this, right? And I'm a very patriotic person. I wear this band with the Indian flag on my hand. I've been wearing it for the last 12 years. And so I called my granddad from campus and I said, we can't let the same happen with Ayurveda. We can't let them take Ayurveda from us and then repackage and sell it back to us, right? So, um, I moved back straight back to India in 2013. Unlike most of my friends, 
uh, who spent some time in the US or the UK after their college, I came straight back to India. Um, and I landed an internship, not a job, by the way. Um, after studying in Ivy League college, my parents spending crores of rupees on my education. I got an internship that at that time paid me 40,000 rupees a month. The place that I got the internship at was very, very, very relevant to what I wanted to do. Right? I, at that time, wanted to... Um, I wanted to work in the business side of brands, right? And so I got a job or an internship at this fund called L Capital Asia, now called L Carlton. It's a private equity fund of the Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy Group. Um, they never they never said they'd give me a job. Um, they said they'd give me an internship and we can see. Uh, but I got when I got there, my dad said, be indispensable in your niche, right? Like whatever you're doing there, make sure you're indispensable and maybe you'll get a job. Uh, so I I joined there. I was 21 and a half. And they were like, hey, this is 2013, August, by the way. And they were like, hey, by the way, um, this thing called e-commerce seems to be happening in India. So um, this company called Mintra has come to us for funding. We don't believe in this thing called e-commerce, but why don't you have a look at the company? The next six months, I spent time on companies like Mintra, Jabong, Pepperfry, Bluestone, and Zivame. Um, and the questions we were asking ourselves at that time, you won't believe it because it's 10 years later now, is will Indians buy clothes online? Will stuff actually be bought without actually touching and feeling the product, right? But I was lucky that I got to see that in the early part of my journey. And I realized very quickly that e-commerce is here to stay. It's not a fad. I became the expert in e-commerce for the fund because nobody else was interested in e-commerce. Um, and it became very relevant in India. And so I got a job. They made me full-time and I worked there for three years. After two and a half, three years working and in investing, um, the sort of, Sheen starts wearing off and you realize you're not actually doing anything. You're giving your, your boss's, boss's, boss's investors money investing in somebody else's business. So I thought I'll, I'll um, want to do something on my own. Um, at this time, I was exploring various opportunities and my grandfather passed. Um, and so we had this rich legacy of Ayurvedic formulations. Um, I remember a promise I'd made him to take forward his legacy. And so at 24 and a half, I quit my job. Um, and said, I'm going to take forward this Ayurveda legacy and, um, and do something with it. Um, I didn't know what, I didn't know how, uh, but that's actually the background of the story to getting to Dr. Vedas. And then I'm sure we'll have... Let's, let's give him a round of applause. We'll so, have lots of questions on what happened at Dr. Vedas. That was the background into the story. And the reason I spent so much time on the background also is uh, because purpose is really important, right? Like why you do what you do um, becomes really important because every day is not great, right? Like all of you guys read about these unicorns and funding rounds and startup founders and all that stuff that the newspapers like to talk about. Uh, but the reality is that all of us will undergo really tough times as we go through our journey. And so for me, in these tough times, I would remember my grandfather, even though he had passed and what he did for me, and that kept me going. So I was at my dad's 50th birthday, April 2016, after my dada passed. I gave a speech at that party. It was in my dad's office. Um, and at this party, I gave a speech on my dad and the sort of impact he had had on my life. Uh, and my dada's clinic was running as a dispensary at this time. Um, it was only for patients who came with this prescription. Um, and so uh, after I gave this speech, my grandfather's nurse of 17 years came up to me and she said, you're talking about your dad, but are you going to let your grandfather's legacy die? And that moment, you know, you that switch flips. And I was like, okay, like, what do I have to lose? Um, let me give this a shot. So from that day onwards, the business begins? The business begins four or five months after that day. Nice, nice, nice. But the trigger comes. The trigger comes and I quit my job. Um, I then had to work on what it is the idea was. Um, make a logo, packaging, branding. And then October 2016, there's this big launch event at Taj Lands Hotel. Taj okay. Lands and Hotel. Okay. Um, and at that time, by the way, I, I still wasn't ready to do e-commerce, right? Because while horizontal e-commerce existed in India, like the marketplaces existed, B2C, e-commerce only brands, that term didn't exist. So I went offline with my brand at this big launch event. 300 people came to the event. Um, there were all these cameras on me. Newspapers were reporting on what I was trying to do. And six distributors signed on. They bought 10 lakhs of stock from me in okay. Jan 2017. And I thought it was off to the races, right? Like, okay, this is going to be amazing. Um, I was working in finance, so I started making this Excel sheet. 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 50 lakhs, 1 crore, 5 crores. And very quickly in my mind, it was a million dollar a month business. But I always say this, 
the best fiction stories are written on excel none of that worked right none of it panned out <laughs> few months i didn't get any reorders but i thought things were okay uh, what i didn't realize is i'd bill to distributors only if distributors bill to retailers and you guys went to the stores to buy my product i would get paid none of you went to the stores to buy my product so when i went to get paid i actually got 9 lakhs worth of stock back Ooh. and only 1 lakh in payment and that's when i realized 22 sales reps all the cost that i have um just making no sense right and so uh i remember locking the door on friday night not opening till monday morning um those you know those moments where like everything seems to be going against you there's despair this is never going to work out etc all of that uh but then in that time i think some good sense prevailed um i was talking to my girlfriend at the time um and she is now my wife uh and became my <laughs> co-founder in the business as well uh and she was like look uh, this offline space you can't stand up against dabar patanjali imami bedinath you can't market like they market consumers don't know you and so it's going to be tough to win in that space but there's no one doing it online and she was in the founding team at nike she worked there 2013 14 and 15 and she saw their journey very early on um and so i made the crazy decision to shut down offline fired 22 of our sales fired. Reps, unfortunately fired yeah. ooh um help them find help them find yeah, jobs yeah, yeah. uh but but just let go of that business completely and then did the crazier thing of convincing my girlfriend to join the business uh we got engaged she joined the business in mid 2017 and that's when the online journey began so very interesting yeah arjun i think uh from studying asthma cricket uh, love for india ayurveda the ayal seeing all the dots connecting yeah now he comes back to india he's setting up uh, dr vedias i still actually think of this this way you know if i had to buy ayurvedic medicines or anything 10 years ago i would have never bought it online sure yeah i would have waited for a prescription gone offline purchased it uh, so but it did not work for you offline as well no so i think look uh, the problem was that in bombay delhi bangalore hyderabad chennai there are enough ayurvedic doctors available okay. there are enough stores selling ayurvedic products and for all of you you can go within 2 or 3 kilometers and find an ayurvedic doctor i'll tell you a little bit of the story and answer your question together sure. so november 2017 it took like 3 months at that time to set up a website today it should, <laughs> it should take less than 3 days but times were different 2017 so we set up this website on shopify like had to find a shopify expert all of those things right and then november 2017 we launched this website with 29 products um and i think the first product i launched um and and maybe you've seen this product it's a product called live it up i've used it yeah it's a ayurvedic hangover product right so when i was 24 and a half years old obviously i didn't want to sell diabetes <laughs> arthritis and asthma right i wanted to be at restaurants bars clubs pubs lounges wine shops so anyone between uh anyone who was partying between 2017 to 2019 would have definitely seen this product in some bar because we sampled 3 lakh packets of this product across bombay pretty much um and i think when we launched our website um what we did is actually we spoke to every single customer who placed an order with us right and we realized that actually this new age hangover product wasn't selling because our customers actually weren't from bombay delhi bangalore hyderabad chennai these customers were coming from anantnag muzaffarnagar imphal and trichy and why were they coming from these places because you have access to an ayurvedic doctor within 2 3 kilometers these people don't have access to a good ayurvedic doctor and care in 10 15 kilometers and what we were delivering them was high quality ayurvedic products and care with a free consultation that my dad used to offer in his clinic online so we had this team of doctors who would answer calls online all at the touch of their fingertips and nobody had been able to deliver that experience so while the concept of consumption of ayurveda was novel and new in 2017 and 2018 online what we realized after speaking to customers were really solving a customer problem and by the way these customers don't look like us okay. they don't work like us they don't behave like us 70% of them don't speak any english at all and so we were like okay our advertising strategy is totally wrong from yeah. arjun <laughs> vedya writing this beautiful english copy we changed to hindi and english advertising uh because 82% of our customers are also the top 10 cities in india it really 82% of our customers and so the big learning for us actually at that time was from speaking to these customers and in that year we went from zero orders a day to one order a day to three orders a day to eventually in november 2018 50 orders a day that these customers 
needed to be catered to in the way, shape, or form that they understood and that appealed to them. Okay. And that may not actually be what appeals to you and me, and that's okay. okay. But they're totally different. They're tier two, tier three. I know I'll tell you a story about this, right? And and this story takes us into 2019. So um TikTok came to India, right? And everyone was using TikTok. And then I started thinking like all my customers must be on TikTok, right? They're not on Instagram and they're not um on Snapchat, they're on TikTok, and my customers love TikTok. And so I um told my advertising agency, my performance marketing agency at that time, hey, like, can we advertise on TikTok? And they were like, they're launching this ad product and it's still coming and we'll give it two weeks. And then two weeks went by and there was nothing, right? Like there was no um, response from them. So I just Googled TikTok leadership team. Um, I found eight names. I DM'd all those eight people on LinkedIn. I said, I want to advertise on your platform. <laughs> I'm an Ayurveda company, please help me. Um, surprisingly, actually, they had very few advertisers at that time. So they were like, so happy to hear from me. <laughs> Um, and this is like maybe Facebook advertising in like 2008, nine, right, where they yeah. would send a representative to your office to help you optimize the ads. And very quickly from 5,000 rupees a day, we started spending 3 lakh rupees a day on TikTok. We were top 10 advertisers in India on TikTok. We reached the platform early okay. and we got the benefits of reaching the platform early. But the reason I'm telling you this story, there's a, there's a reason. I'm not just going in circles. So I was in the office in 2019. Uh, at this time, one of our top selling products was an Ayurvedic muscle gain supplement. Okay. called Herbo Build. If you guys check it out, it's still number one bestseller in the mass and weight gainer category on Amazon. I'm walking past our performance marketing team and the TikTok guy sitting in our office and I see this really, really crappy ad, right? It's like jarring music, lots of pictures, like animation in, out, like really, really what I thought really unaesthetic, unattractive content. And so I go to the, the team and I'm like, hey guys, like I understand the customer is different from what appeals to me, but my family's name is on this ad and I just can't let this ad go. Like you have to remove this ad and take it down right now. It's embarrassing that this content is coming out from us. Right. And the guy looks back at me and he says, sir, this ad is running at seven X ROI. Do you want me to take it down? Ooh. I was like, sorry, keep going with that. <laughs> because we have to step outside our comfort zone and our small world of our social circle to understand consumption in our country because consumption in our country is much more than the way we consume. My friends and family were like, congratulations, your product is selling at Nobel Chemist. Who knows Nobel Chemist, Nobel Pharmacy is here. Yeah. Oh, all of us. Everyone was like, Nobel Chemist, great stuff. I was selling like 40,000 rupees a month from Nobel Chemist and I was doing 40,000 rupees a day on my website. So while they thought it was great, it was actually just pretty, it was actually a waste of time. The amount of headache that Nobel Chemist <laughs> would give me to sell that product was a waste of time, right? And so it's very different. And that tried helping me to start thinking Bharat instead of India. Wow, and interesting. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. But how did this journey, how did this journey grow from? And I've seen one of your talks where you said that you were getting in three days, you would get one order worth 700 bucks. Yeah. And then that number has absolutely gone very far. Right. So that, that journey of increasing the revenue, the sales, the orders sure. per day, what, what did you do to, to improve the average daily revenue? Yeah, I guess you guys all know digital marketing. So I'll split our journey into two parts, right? There was the one year of failure offline and then one year of figuring out online. Um, so two years of what I call product market fit. Um, and that two years was learning, talking to every customer, learning Facebook advertising, Google advertising ourselves running the Shopify backend, trying discounts, offers, all of those things. And then eventually hitting what we call, we called PMF or product market fit, which was November, 2018, 50 orders a day, just on our website, not including marketplaces. We didn't even focus on marketplace actually 50 orders a day on our website at an average order value of 750 bucks um, at a customer acquisition cost of 30% of average order value with a gross margin of 75% on the business. So fundamentally, we made a little bit of money on every order, right? If you assume that logistics is 10, 15%, and then some returns come back for COD orders, we are making like what we call contribution margin, 10, 15% on every order. When we started hitting that consistently on a one week where we hit these 50 orders a day, every day, when you have been struggling for two years, 
banging your head against the wall saying who will ever buy my product and who will ever um, engage with our brand and buy from us. Then we started saying, okay, this is, this is working now, right? And as an entrepreneur, when things start working, you smell the business, right? And so Trisha and I started smelling the business. And then we said, now at this stage, the business is sustainable, makes sense. It's actually a business. Now let's hyperscale it from here. So what we were doing at 50 orders a day, the good part about actually being a digital first business is you can scale exponentially from there. So it took us two years to get from zero to 50 orders a day. And then we just went from first gear to top gear. And we got from 50 orders a day to 5,000 orders a day Oof. Um, in a Oof. two year period. Right. But what was the tougher part of the journey? Honestly, it was zero to 50 and not 50 to 5,000 because figuring out what works actually is the tougher part. Once it starts working, then you just consistently start getting network, network effects of scale. Right. So we got 5,000 orders a day on our website, but once we started getting 1,000, 2,000 orders a day on our website, Amazon started firing on its own because customers were coming on our website and they were like, actually, I'm more comfortable buying on Amazon. And so the Amazon guy started coming to me saying, hey, what's happening? You're not even marketing. Your A cost, right? Uh, basically, the cost of revenue on Amazon was less than 5%. They were like, brands don't have this. What we realized is actually their customers moving from our website to buy it, right? But once you start hitting that journey of scale and exponential scale, um, network effects kick in, your brand gets known. Then I would go to the airport, I'd wear a doctor, wear this t-shirt, people would come up to me, okay, you're part of this brand, I know your product, what do you think of this product, etc. That's a good like feeling, that. right? Amazing feeling. The first time I was at an airport and someone saw my t-shirt and said, hey, I, I know you, I know you. I don't know you. They didn't realize I was the founder of the business. They're like, I know this brand, I saw an ad on TikTok here, I want to buy this product. It's a good feeling, yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Very nice. Very, very, very interesting. Yeah. But so tell me one thing. You did a lot of performance marketing. A lot of it. Yeah. By yourself, by agencies, how? We learned it ourselves and then eventually built a team and then also had agency. And if I had to split up your performance marketing, did you do way more bottom brand? Uh, did you do way more brand top funnel marketing, bottom funnel marketing, email marketing? What, what was it? What was your mix like? Yeah, so look, I'll tell you, the, the world in 2017 and 18 was a very different world from the world today. There were much less customers online, but there were also many less brands online. So we got away by cheating, actually. And <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean, we just did conversion-focused performance marketing advertising, and we got the ROI we needed because there was nobody else doing it. So this is pure bottom funnel advertising. Pure bottom funnel conversion-focused selling product advertising, and it worked at the ROI because competition was nothing. Nobody was interested in selling Ayurveda online. By the time the people got interested, I reached 1,000 orders a day and COVID hit. So pretty much nobody could compete with us, right? But we cheated. Today, if you ask me a brand, I've invested in like more than 80 companies. Lots of them are D2C brands. Um, you can't do this today, right? You can't do this today because the number of brands has increased. While the number of customers increased, the competition has also increased and the supply of ads remains the same. So I didn't do any branding or like less than 5% of my spend was branding. Um, and had I not sold the business when I did, I would have had to change the strategy because today solely performance marketing driven e-commerce business is dead. Is dead? It's absolutely dead. It is gone. It's so over. you, you recommend you need to do brand marketing and yeah, what I, what I tell founders today, at least what I've seen the most efficient founders do is be consistent about a percentage of your spend for brand on a monthly basis. So you say, let's say it's 20% or 25%. Or 15%. And brand could be content, it could be influencers, it could be videos, it could be brand associations, partnerships, sponsoring events, offline events. All of that comes into the large bucket of brand, right? But be consistent about the percent you spend on brand on a monthly basis. And why do I say that? Because lots of founders come and say, yeah, we got this big influencer. We gave this influencer 3 lakh rupees. We did one video <laughs> and then nothing happened. So we stopped <laughs> doing it completely, right? Brand doesn't happen tomorrow. <clears throat> Brand is like SEO. SEO doesn't happen tomorrow, right? You do SEO for like the same thing with founders, right? I did SEO for two months, kuch nahi hua ban kiya. but actually nothing happens for the first six months, right? So the formula today that I've seen working from the most successful brands is 20 or 25% of their budget on a consistent basis every single month. And if the budget increases, you increase it because the percentage has to remain the same on top of funnel that actually increases your brand recall. When your brand is then seen on a conversion ad, the consumer knows what the brand is and then clicks through. Interesting. So we need to do both. Absolutely. We I didn't, but, but you need to. By the way, he eventually then successfully sold off his business at a very high valuation, higher than 100 crores. If you want to speak about that. Yeah, so we hit uh, 5,000 orders a day. Um, I think we had a really good run during COVID, right? 
why do we have a good run in covid because i don't know if all of you guys remember march 2020 there was a lot of panic but also the government was openly talking about ayurveda to help improve your immunity and we were the largest ayurveda brand online in india at that time right so also oh, that worked in favor and how because everybody wanted to buy online the large companies hadn't set up online and so thousands of customers stormed to dr vedyas uh, it was extremely physically and emotionally challenging because we couldn't convince people to come into the warehouse to work right people were really scared in april 20 but we had to keep it going right like there were days when we hit 11000 12000 orders a day on our website what for people who live close by to my house i would go and pick them up in my car <laughs> and my wife and i would take the four of them and six of us would work in the warehouse we'd unload 750 kilos worth of goods from a tempo every second day um the building was very strict our our warehouse building so they would allow the tempo to be parked at the gate of the building and we'd unload the tempo at the gate and then on trolleys move the stock into the warehouse uh but we kept it going and we were able to successfully launch seven products in the first three months april to june 20 our uh, immunity products the first fruit and veggie wash in bombay was launched by us um sanitizer uh kadha kadha was really big in 2020 and 2021 so we leveraged our opportunity very well we reached this revenue scale and then our investors actually uh made an offer to buy the business um and i know i'll get questions on why did we sell um i think at some point we started believing that e-commerce or digital only will not be the way to exponentially scale this business and so the business would have to start going back to offline and i sucked at offline right i was just <laughs> really really bad at it and so i felt like the next leg of growth for the brand had to be um offline plus online and online the work had already been done um so uh, that's the more sort of philosophical way to answer the question we also got offered a really good value for our business <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so we sat down we rationalized we thought about it and then we made the crazy decision to actually sell our business in april 2021 um and yeah we we went ahead and did that and then pretty much from spending 95% of my day thinking about one thing i had to find other things to do let's let's give it up for him i love the answer by the way right going back to instead of you know only click to click and motor and that's why exit the company and and tell us a little bit about your investor because they seem to have a huge network of offline yeah so uh, there is a company called rp sanjeev goinka group uh, they own spencers they recently bought nature's basket they have this large brand called tuyam it's a healthy snacking business um and so they were building a house or a group of fmcg brands so they now have a brand called naturally in the personal care space they acquired a gujarat based namkeens business called evita um and so they wanted to build this sort of house of consumer brands um and they invested in our business in june 2019 so they got to know us over 21 months and then eventually decided to buy this business and now you can see dr vedya's in all of these offline stores as well and you'll be able to find the product um and see the product uh and i think it was the right home for the business as well nice. because it's a home that knew offline and nice. we didn't nice 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 so you know um, my content team has specifically asked me to ask you this question which is that in some of your previous talks you mentioned that brand should find their moat m o a t i don't know what that is yet yeah right but they said even they don't know what it is so why not hear it from you yeah so look um, like in history you would have studied that there are these forts and these castles which has this water body around it called a moat right um and the moat is an additional line of defense that allows you to protect the castle or the fort or the king and we think about from branding perspective and branding terms as well a moat is the opposite of a me too brand basically right and what is a moat moat is a price geo launched um for g at in india right because it was 70% cheaper than anyone else moat is the convenience you get when you remove your when you have an iphone and you remove your airpods from the case and it automatically connects that convenience moat is the format that dr vedya's repatch repackage chavan prash in right so how many of you guys grew up and had chavan prash at some point in your life yeah how many of you guys hated chavan prash so chavan prash is a black bitter sticky inconvenient paste right it's good for you <laughs> but the format sucks and kids of my age 
couldn't tell our parents that we don't like it and we were forced to have it people of your age actually could tell your parents i don't like it right and so the chavan prash market was stagnant at 600 to 800 crores and has been for the last 10 years india's population is increasing on a daily basis as more kids being added every single day how can chavan prash not grow because you guys stopped having it after the first bite or the third bite right and so we repackaged chavan prash or created the world's first chavan prash in toffee form a product called chakash i think now they've renamed it my prash um and so kids started having chavan prash again so the moat was chavan prash in a toffee form so that people actually enjoy having it right <laughs> what does moat mean um moat in branding construct means something unique and differentiated that allows you to stand apart from everybody else in the ecosystem or every other brand in the ecosystem and why is it important because there's so much right a an average consumer sees 1000 to 3000 brands on a daily basis how do you remember anything right unless something actually is a long lasting impression on you or some proposition is uniquely differentiated it's just one of the many things that you're you're sort of exposed to on a daily basis and that's why today actually moat has become even more important because as we start our online shopping journey and our digital consumption journey and you go on amazon and you see you search for a peanut butter right i was an investor in um india's largest peanut butter brand called my fitness peanut butter and when i go and search for my fitness peanut butter now i see 30 other peanut butter brands right why should i buy my fitness over the other peanut butter brands and they had sahil khan as their brand ambassador and they had hardik pandya and they had all of this and they claim their product is better than the others etc all of that but what that is that allows you to choose this product over the 30 other products on amazon that's moat yeah and moat by the way can be different things right moat can be price moat can be convenience moat can be format moat can be ingredients like mama earth was the first brand to launch toxin free cruelty free products in the indian market now hundreds of brands do it but the time they launched it that's what they did so moat can be various things but it has to be something so arjun now that you're an investor you've invested in multiple brands um and you know yesterday arjun put up a reel on instagram which is how do you crack your investor meeting right so some of these guys some day cuz they all know digital marketing might become i don't know if d2c founders but founders right and they might need funding they might need investor uh, help they might need some mentorship how do you crack that how do you crack your investor relationship you know yeah look i would say that um, as an investor uh, and i i've been doing this only for 18 months now so i'm not an expert yet uh, but as an investor when we look at businesses we look at three things right especially when i invest early stage um, one we look at the i look at the person right who is that person why would they fight through the toughest times and why do they have a right to win like there are a lot of problems that um the world needs to solve in space i'm not an aeronautical engineer right? so i had a right to win in ayurveda and that's why i was the right bet in ayurveda right so who is the person why do they have a right to win 50% of my decision goes on that 20% goes on market size right talk to you guys about why my business actually catered to a larger consumer set than just an urban niche elite audience um, when you're an investor looking to invest in a business you say okay the business is at x but there needs to be a way for this business to go to 10x and only if there is market enough for it to go to 10x is it worth my time or investment so that's 20% and then the third part of the decision is the standard stuff right business unit economics growth velocity revenue gross margin bottom line customer acquisition cost lifetime value and team right there has to be more than one person involved in building this business so that's the three things i look at when i'm looking to invest in a business so it's in it's the it's person owner 50% market size 30% market size and 30% business economic and team, team and margin and everything else so you got to be good if you want to get money okay not your idea not your product you yourself got to be good first so arjun in this entire journey you must have come across multiple data points you know you've analyzed data points on your website on your ads which have been some of your key data points to look at and you know that tells you this is your north star metric or this is your the go to metric which has made you take the business ahead any yeah. metrics you looked at yeah so look i i was speaking to a founder yesterday um her she runs a business in the uh, feminine hygiene space right and she was like by the way arjun what do you think of data analytics i've set up this um data analytics dashboard for my business on tableau and i get this like these dashboards real time etc all of that so i was like okay cool that's pretty impressive um how many orders do you do on a monthly basis and she hesitated for like 30 seconds and said 
I'll have to check that, but I think 3,000 maybe, right? And then I was like, okay. Um, so 3,000 orders on a monthly basis means you do 100 orders a day. Um, she was like, uh, maybe like 80. And then I was like, okay, how many orders come on a daily basis consistently from your website? And she was like, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, right? So uh, there's lots of data points available. Lots of data points available. And you can get lost in just getting a lot of data and not processing it at all. I would look at four things every morning in my business, right? What was yesterday's revenue? Number one. Number two, what channels did I get this revenue from? So my website, Amazon, Flipkart, Farm Easy, um, NetMeds, where did I get this revenue from? What products sold, right? So which of, how much percent of my revenue came from my muscle gain product? How much percent came from my weight gain product? How much percent came from my immunity range, et cetera, all of that. And then what is the ROI or ROAS per channel? These are the four things I looked at on a daily basis because all the other metrics like customer acquisition cost, like click-through rates, all translate into these four metrics eventually, right? And so you can see these dashboards where there are like hundreds of metrics, but reality is you can't track 100, 100 metrics, right? So I would see these four numbers um, and I used to get this small Excel screenshot on a group that we used to have called Performance Marketing Daily MIS um, every morning and we'd understand the health of our business from that. Then if you want to deep dive on something, you can deep dive. But as long as you keep it simple and you actually understand the background of each of these metrics and you know them real time, the problem is when you realize actually that, hey, by the way, um, I'm looking at my data from 15 days ago and actually I did really bad 15 days ago. Um, it's unacceptable in a digital business. You have to know your data real time. We used to have performance marketing standups twice a day, 12 o'clock and five o'clock. So just in case something's gone wrong in the last three or four hours, you would actually know what's happening and, and react to it. Wow. Wow. Every five, like it's like 15 minutes. If there's nothing to discuss, it's okay. We'll just say hello for 15 minutes. Right. But every day at 12 and five, there's a 15 minute standup. Just to check if all your ads are working, exactly. traffic is coming, exactly. e-commerce is safe, payment gateway is working. I feel you. I, yeah. I come across yeah. a lot of this. So um, just to add to this, you know, I've also been building IID and the one metric I look at every day, how many students are enrolling, which sources are they coming from, which courses are they going Correct. to? This is my daily report every day for the last 10 years. And this has led for me to look at growth and every other parameter goes around it. So when he said that, I could relate every morning, 9 a.m., this has to come to my inbox. Every morning, 9 a.m. But I, I, I actually... Uh... Now that you said it, it's actually a very relevant thing to talk about. And sometimes people get lost in data. So, I mean, for you, now that you're investing in businesses, I think this is a very relevant question for you to ask. Like, that. I used to go to my dad's office and prior to having an investor, we would make him like our invest, tell him how the business did. And then he'd ask some number and we wouldn't know it. And he'd be like, how do you not know that number? And it would really annoy me. Right? Like, really, really annoy me that he would ask that number and expect me to know that number. But now if I sit on the other side of the table as an investor and a founder says, I don't know how many orders I do on a monthly basis. <laughs> I'm like, then it's not. Uh, Move on. You need to know that. And Arjun, now all of these guys, and this is probably my last formal question to you. And in terms of a formal question, these guys are going to go for interviews. They're going to go join companies. You've hired people. You're investing in companies, which is hiring a lot of people. Uh, any advice you want to give to these guys? Open advice. It could be on skill sets, temperament, you know, attitude, anything. So yeah. that reel I put up yesterday on four tips to crack your investor meeting, that could actually be translated into interview, right? And so what is it that you can do to better engage in a conversation while you're going for an interview, right? The first thing is there were just too many times that I was in an interview where I asked the person, why did you come for this interview? What do you know about my organization? And they said, I saw an ad. I don't even remember the name of the company, right? And that's, like that is over. The conversation is over there. I may humor the person for 10 minutes, but that's, that's it. It's over, right? So do as much research as you can about the organization and the person you're interviewing with. If you, if you come to an interview with me and you start talking to me about cricket because you know I like cricket and you've done that research and it's very easy to find out that I like cricket because it's available. That information can be Googled very easily. That already impresses me, right? So that's step number one. Step number two, always engage in a dialogue, right? So if you're talking about your background, there are times when 
I've had someone talk for 30 minutes non-stop about their background without even like stopping and checking <laughs> that there is a conversation happening, right? And, and the same thing with pitches. Like, there's a one-hour call block, and the person talks for 55 minutes non-stop without even hearing any questions from me. Number three, um, be open to feedback and preempt questions. Like, before I go into any conversation in any setting like this. I preempt the answer to the question. Why did you sell your business? Because everybody asks me that, right? I've got that question three hundred times. So I have to have a good answer to that question. <laughs> so preempt the questions you will get. And the fourth and most important thing is end the conversation with a sense check. Like, hey, what are the next steps from here? Is there anything else I can do? Do you want me to do a task um, or a task based or or like a project or an assignment to take it forward to show that you are actually proactive to see what happens next? You can do these four things. You should be able to do much much better than you. Interviews than than the other people who are coming to those interviews. Oh yeah, and the last thing, if you are doing a cold reach out email, um, there are lots of tools that allow you to personalize these. Do not start an email with dear sir slash ma'am. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> means that means you've not even used mail merge. Like simple, so, simple. Basically. Your email marketing needs to be on point. Yeah, it has to say dear f name. Yeah, we all learned that, right? In email marketing. Okay, awesome. I think with that, let's end today's super session. Let's give a big round of applause. I think this was a fun one. I think the information that Arjun shared was, firstly, I think super candid. And Arjun, one important thing that I'd like this audience to do is somehow, you know, I've seen you're very active online. Uh, which platform can they follow you on to know more about what's happening in the world? To learn from your experiences, how can they connect and follow you? Just Instagram or LinkedIn. I I don't use any other social. Okay. Media. And so what Instagram. what is your handle go by on Instagram? A B Vedya. A B Vedya. And on LinkedIn, my name. And with that, let's end today's episode. <laughs>